so to start off with, I'd like to welcome everyone um, and to who has come to the kind of the info session this evening for the Lay Law program, uh, and join me in this Trinity Blue Void uh, to talk about the program for 2021. So just to set the uh, set the housekeeping, I suppose, for the evening. Um, so to introduce myself, my name is Joel McKeever. I'm the Student Employability Officer with Trinity Career Service, uh, and what that means, amongst other things, is that I manage the uh, laid law program uh, for the university and um, so over the course of the next hour or so what I'm going to do is uh, go through some slides to give you an overview of the program for 2021 um, and this is very much a <clears throat> this is very much a supplement uh, to the information that's available on our website uh, which I'll take you through very briefly at the end as well so uh, we've done a big piece of work that year or this year with feedback from students in terms of what's useful and what's not useful etc um, to update that website and give an application guide and give examples. So I won't, uh, I'll try not to go through too much here uh, that's covered there for you, uh, but there will primarily be an opportunity for me to pull out some of the important sections uh, and also mainly for you to give some questions at the end and if there's anything that you're interested in finding more about. Um, so throughout the course of the next uh, probably say about half hour or so, um, if you do have any questions, if you want to pop them in the chat, uh, feel free to do so. I may answer them as I'm going through. Uh, and we will also have a Q&A section at the end, uh, but anything that I don't, I'll pick up from the chat uh, and I'll answer there as well. Um, I will say that this session uh, is primarily focused at eligible students who are looking to apply to the 2021 uh, Leg Law Programme. Um, you're welcome to stay if that's not you, uh, but we will have um, particularly sp specific sessions for staff members who are considering supervising Leg Law students next week as well, and I can give some more information about that. Uh, but otherwise, that's really what the focus is, is, is kind of helping you know more about the Lego program and potentially prepare an application for it. Um, and also, obviously, to let you know, as you probably saw as you entered the room, uh, we are recording uh, the session. Uh, that's obviously just to share with people who can't, uh, can't attend this evening, if you want to look back over any of the material. Um, so I suppose to start off, uh, what I'm going to do is just take you through a few slides about what the Lay Law Programme is. Uh, and you may have seen some of this if you've gone through our website already. Um, but essentially, uh, the Lay Law Programme uh, was funded uh, and sponsored by uh, Lord Lay Law of Rothamay, who is a, a philanthropist and an entrepreneur who uh, does a, a wider range of benefaction to different education causes uh, around the UK, in Ireland and internationally. Uh, and specifically in terms of the uh, Leg Law Scholarship, um, which was started in 2014, he gifts up to 25 scholarships per year to 12 uh, institutions uh, who are in the Leg Law Network. Um, and so through that, uh, the scholarship funds the students to take part in the Leg Law Programme. Um, so we've had the Leg Law Programme in Trinity since 2018. Uh, we're the first and currently only uh, Irish uh, university in the network. Uh, and with the 2021 scholars, we'll be taking in our fourth uh, intake of scholars onto the program. So in terms of what the, the program is, uh, and you may be familiar from the title, from the material that I say, a program for undergraduate leadership and research. Um, but why, and, and why is he sponsored this essentially? Um, so the purpose of the scholarship, and, and I'll, I'll try to do as little uh, reading from the slides as possible as I go through, but I think this is, uh, this is significant. The purpose is to invest in talented and motivated undergraduate students, giving them the knowledge, skills, and experience to become active global citizens and future leaders. And that word uh, leader and leadership is going to come up a lot in terms of the material I talk through, um, because this is very much an integrated program. So uh, there's a, a kind of very attractive and very compelling research component to it, which is very uh, fitting the research university that we are. Uh, but that's one part of it and kind of uh, Kind of a big kind of structure around the framework is very focused on developing leadership skills. Uh, that might be in academia, it might be in business, it might be in development or, or community work or, or any kind of area after you finish college. Um, but it's essentially about giving you the skills to be a, a well-rounded, uh, kind of ethical and capable person who can make positive change in society, something which is you know, even more relevant, I think we'll all agree in, in, in recent years in terms of being able to enact change on kind of an effective, effective scale. So that's a lot of what the Lego program is about. It's not necessarily about um, constant um, 
high performance or constant expectation that students taking part are already coming into the program with a wealth of experience uh, and incredibly high grades uh, and kind of nothing to actually develop through the program. It is very much a, a development uh, process and we're looking for students, which I'll talk a little bit more about as we go through, we're looking for students who are uh, committed, who show potential, who show work ethic and are willing to work with the other people on the program uh, and that's kind of the profile uh, of it. It's a kind of 18 month journey with research and leadership development uh, involved. So in terms of the partner universities, which is I think, a little, little interesting to show you, um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a range of universities kind of across, as I said, Ireland, UK and internationally. Um, so the first university was the University of Leeds, that's Lord Laidlaw's uh, alma mater, uh, and it's developed throughout the UK with some of our kind of significant partners noted there at the moment out of the 12. Uh, St. Andrews University, uh, University of York and, and UCL have been involved for, for a long time. Uh, and it's also now expanding into North America. So we have University of Toronto, Columbia College in New York, uh, and recently Cornell have joined uh, in addition to a number of other universities you'll see there. So in terms of students who are part of the Laidlaw program when you're in the network, it's very much built around the, the intersection of these different uh, institutions. And um, so we have the program that we do here in Trinity, which is bespoke for Trinity students, but it also ties into events that are happening uh, in the other universities, there are uh, kind of cross university events that happen. There's online content, there's a online network that students plug into and they, they share the research there and they collaborate on different projects. Uh, and there's usually an annual, uh, annual conference as well. Uh, so something I should mention as well, and I suppose the, the, the elephant in the room in terms of um, obviously the, the COVID-19 crisis and the effect that's had on education and indeed on the Laid Law program as well. So it goes without saying that like everything else in, in, in universities, we've had to shift um, the majority of our work uh, online uh, during this period, uh, which has been across the board, I think considered to be you know, a big piece of work, but very effective in terms that it has um, prompted the institutions to share a lot of resources and to do a lot of content, which we wouldn't have been able to do previously in terms of um, students in, in Boston joining us for, for events or, or offering events and kind of shared talks and, and things like that. So I'll be very honest in terms of the plan for the program for the 2021 scholars. Uh, we're looking at uh, we're looking at making uh, plans that are aware of those potential issues around travel, uh, potential lifting of restrictions as well. Uh, but essentially, a, a program that can be flexible and something that can incorporate whatever happens over the next the next 12 months. And so that's something which we'll be building into our planning for that group of students. That's also something if you're making an application. We'll be very much asking you to look at as well in terms of how would your research project, how would your leadership plan uh, adapt if you have to do it in a, a blended or remote, a remote context. But just to say that we, we are very much aware of it and it is built into, into what we're talking about here. So eligibility to apply, and I suppose up top, if you're considering application, this is one of the key things uh, to talk through. So the eligibility is, is, is quite broad and it's, it's relatively easy to fit into it. Um, all we're looking for is for you to be a registered undergraduate student. Um, so you have to be currently in, in, in Trinity, not off books, not off books taking assessment um, during the course of the program for obvious reasons. And then in terms of the eligibility, you have to be either in the second year of a four year undergraduate degree program, second or third year of a five year undergrad program, or the second or third year of a five year integrated master's program, uh, such as the MAI or the pharmacy program. So in layman's terms, essentially you have to be in the middle of your program so that over the course of the 18 months um, you won't graduate from Trinity before you finish the late law program. It's, it's as simple as that. In terms of el eligibility for students um, who are potentially uh, going abroad on Erasmus or non-EU non exchanges or anything of that nature, uh, they are eligible to apply and they're welcome to apply. But like any student, what we would say to them is that there are certain sessions, um, again, given the restrictions and given what's possible, the certain sessions and certain content which are delivered in person and if as much as possible will accommodate kind of blended delivery and online content and things like that. But for the things that you have to be in person for, it's up to the student to make the arrangements to be there for it. So in, again, in simple terms, if you are on an Erasmus year and you know that coming up in two months there's going to be a weekend that's taking place in Trinity, you have to travel back for that weekend and that will be up to you to arrange. Um, so that's kind of part of the requirements that we ask for the students. Outside of that, there is no, um, 
there is no restrictions in terms of being on a exchange or, or anything like that. Um, if you can be available for the content and if you fit into that eligibility, um, then you're, you're, you're welcome. You're welcome to apply. Um, and then the other thing to note in terms of eligibility and something we would advise you kind of to take into consideration when you're looking at the program is whether you're available for all the requirements uh, over the course of the program. So yes, there is a research project in the first summer, there's a leadership and action experience in the second summer and there's leadership days throughout. So those are kind of locked in and those are things you have to take part in to, to have the learning and to progress in the program. Um, but even if you take part in that, on top of that, there's other things that are always going on in terms of the program. There's, um, we'll go through them in a little bit, but there's kind of outreach activities, there's peer learning groups, there's, as I mentioned, conferences and webinars and different skills sessions, a kind of a, a, a uh, what's the word I'm looking for, a constellation of different things that are happening uh, alongside the core programming. Um, so when you're looking to see whether it's something you'll commit time to, um, as I'll, we'll, we'll go through, it is a big investment of time, it is a, it does require work and it requires kind of a, a lot of your, your motivation um, and just to make certain that's something you can fit in around your studies, around placements, around any other timings like that. So I will show a timeline of the program in terms of what we have at the moment and you can have a think about that in terms of you know, where that fits into your own undergraduate course and your other commitments. And what I will say is that again for given current circumstances, some of those dates we have are just indicative at the moment. We can just say we intend for it to be in early March or that this will be finished by the end of summer. And um, so we usually look to confirm those as soon as possible, which has been a little harder at the moment because of the kind of the changing restrictions. But what we, we do um, make sure is that once we have that confirmed, we share it with the students and we work around your availability as much as we can within the dates that we have. So that is something we'll always be upfront about as soon as that's made, made kind of confirmed for us, uh, we'll make that available to you as well. Um, so what is involved in the Laid Law Programme? What, what, what exactly are you doing if you're a Laid Law Scholar? Um, so there's a couple of key things uh, which I'm going to highlight and there's more detailed material on the website you can go through, uh, but this is kind of the, the key takeaways that I'd like you to have uh, from the info session. So again, the, the core framework that everything fits into, all the different sessions, the uh, the research work, all of it within this leadership development uh, program, which is kind of the core, uh, the core learning outcome uh, for Laid Law Scholars. So within that, there's an 18 month personal developments and, and skills training program, uh, which involves a number of different workshops. It involves uh, personal one-to-one -one coaching, personal uh, development plans that we work on you with, uh, reflective work, all of which I'll go, go through in a little bit. And the seven full days of workshops uh, that we do uh, on leadership skills and that's in the group, uh, within the, the Laid Law Scholars, um, of which, um, as I think I mentioned, but there's usually about 20 to 25 scholars uh, each year, depending on how many, how many students are successful. So you work within those groups. Uh, and then in the um, leadership side of things, a big focus um, for the foundation, which funds the, the, the Laid Law Program and, and us, is the leadership and action experience which takes place in summer two. So I'll go through in more detail what that looks like, um, but essentially it's that after you have your first year in the program, your first summer with your research project, that in the second summer you have an opportunity to apply the skills you've developed in some practical setting in some way that puts you out of your comfort zone in a new environment and has some practical and positive good for society. So there's a couple of different options in terms of what you can do for that, uh, but that's a big piece. What I have there in terms of being a five to six weeks funded experience, um, I'll go through in a little more detail at the end in terms of how that funding works. Uh, in some cases, it might be a stipend that's paid to you directly, or it might fund the actual trip or experience you're going on. So but you will get the value essentially of the funding and the scholarship through that. And as I mentioned, this one-to-one -one coaching, we give a lot of um, kind of personalized feedback on your assignments, uh, and kind of you know, tailored to what you want to develop. And the peer learning groups uh, within this, the cohort. And then in terms of outputs from the program, there is a research poster, there is uh, some presentations to be asked to do, and then there's a reflective report that you go through after each summer as well. Um, so looking at the research project, which I imagine for a lot of people is one of the very attractive things and one of the very motivating things about the, the Laid Law program. Um, so it is six weeks of funding research, uh, self-directed in, in what will be summer 2021. And um, those dates and the format and all that will be agreed uh, with us and yourself and your potential supervisor. 
and as, as I say, they're supported by an academic supervisor. So part of the process in terms of developing a research proposal is finding an academic um, who will support that proposal, who will work with you on it, who will give you the resources you might need to deliver it, depending you know, within their department, wherever that might be, and who essentially can mentor you through the process. Um, inevitably, the best laid research proposals uh, for six weeks uh, always hit certain stumbling blocks or pivots or have to be reframed and that's where the academic supervisor will come into it and will really be able to, to help you with that. Um, so I'll go through towards the end about how you might approach a research supervisor um, but I will say that at this point um, you know, all the academic staff in the college have been notified about the program and they'd be quite familiar with it after the last four years and um, so it is a or the four, last four cycles so it is a something you can approach them with and they will be open to uh, kind of having that conversation with you. Um, so within the research side of things as well, there's opportunities uh, to apply for additional funding for things like research travel, if it's relevant to your project, and um, attendance at conferences, uh, again, on kind of a case-by-case -case basis, if it's something that's going to further your research, project expenses and, and things like that. Uh, and there's an opportunity through that Lake Law Network to share your research with other ac uh, academic students and academic staff throughout the, the institutions. And we have seen over the years, you know, students have finished their research projects uh, and through the relationship they have with the academics uh, or through their experience, they publish papers or in journals, uh, they've developed um, kind of promising uh, business ideas and patterns and, and, and different things. So it can be spun out in a lot of different ways. Uh, and then more broadly in terms of the laid law community itself. So as I said, there's a constellation of, of different kind of activities around the core program. Um, which are essentially to, you know, I suppose the idea is that if you're involved with these things, this could give you an opportunity outside of just the, the teaching and learning environment and um, to kind of explore them a bit, a bit more with people who are also interested in, in, in that kind of development. So there's discussion groups, there's different professional networking events, there's also a lot of social events that happen through the program as well uh, between, between the scholars and between the different institutions. Uh, and then there's optional skills training sessions throughout as well. So we've had you know, students say, um, oh, you know, I, 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 I'd like to learn more about Photoshop in terms of if I'm developing my poster for this and we've organized Photoshop uh, sessions through IT services and things like that. So we're very open to hearing um, feedback from the students on the program in terms of what can be tailored uh, to them over the course of, course of the 18 months. Uh, a big focus for the foundation as well is community outreach and volunteering. So under the umbrella of the Laidlaw Foundation, there's a couple of other initiatives they do. Uh, that support um, schools in disadvantaged areas and uh, different community uh, outreach programs. And um, so something that's very much built into the Laid Law uh, program as well. And we uh, have opportunities for scholars to do that through engagement with things like Trinity Access Program uh, and the different kind of uh, civic engagement opportunities that are here in Trinity. We tie scholars into that to put, again, that leadership experience and that, I suppose, citizenship uh, that we're trying to develop through the program into practice. Uh, and then there's online content, there's webinars and different global speakers that come in for the program as well. So just to have a look at the timeline uh, for the next, um, for 2021 in terms of the 2021 scholars. Um, so here we are in December 2020 and the applications are open now. I'll take you through the application process at the end. Uh, and they're going to close on the 8th of February. Uh, and then through February and March, we're going to have the selection process and uh, we're going to go through all the components of the application for the students uh, and then depending on if students are successful in that first stage they might move forward to an interview stage with the selection panel as well which will be through February and March and um, with the aim to have the scholars confirmed informed and announced by early April and then in mid-April we'll have a welcome event um, ideally in person uh, with uh, the label uh, scholars, the like, community, academics and students have been involved before and, and interested uh, kind of parties in Trinity. And then we'll have uh, a day of induction as well, or a half day of induction where we go through everything that will have to be uh, done on the program. Uh, we set up the, the peer learning group, groups, we go through the learning outcomes, we kind of give you all the skills you need to go forward uh, into the summer. And then uh, our plan is to initially have the first two days of training in your leadership. One component will be in late May. Um, and then that will lead you into your, your first summer on the program, which will be the six week research project. Depending on your faculty, depending on what the program, the proposal is, that could involve you working, you know, fairly solo in terms of a, 
a research project that's very self-directed and very just ties in with you and your supervisor or for people who are more in a lab environment could be working with a research group it could be um, working on something that's more team-based as well but you'll be doing that over the summer uh, and then with the kind of the submission the outputs all of that happening uh, in september in 2021 uh, and then leading up to a second uh, second set of leadership days in november uh, where we have two days there as well and throughout the whole program and you'll see this kind of in both the first and second year there's that ongoing community events the social events the one-to-one -one coaching the personal development plan reflective exercises all of that happens uh, in the margins in between these kind of core these core days and then if we look at the 2022 timeline, uh, we have uh, a plan at the moment for in 2022 to have a residential weekend, which will usually be an away weekend um, with uh, kind of outdoor kind of team uh, building activities and kind of sessions that we can do away from Trinity uh, in late February. Uh, and then going into the second summer, uh, you have your five to six week leadership and action experience. Um, now structurally, that might be similar to your research experience in terms of when it takes place in the summer it might even involve depending on the option you go with for the leadership in action it might involve some development of that research but as i said it's in a more applied setting that's kind of more um out of the lab and out of the library into into, into a kind of a, a practical a practical environment over summer two and then lastly in september 22 that's the final submissions that we have which would lead into uh, kind of a summative training day that we have, which will kind of reflect and kind of um, bring together what we've done over the course of the previous 18 months. And then after that graduation, celebration, everyone has a great time. And then you join from that to the kind of the Laidlaw alumni community. So we have an alumni group for Laidlaw scholars at Trinity, and that ties into events that are happening with the, the network. So we still have students who have been involved in previous years kind of come back in. Uh, there's some mentoring with newer students, there's uh, some events that we um, support them in pushing on if they have a speaker in as well. So there's kind of an, an ongoing kind of, it doesn't just finish uh, when you finish in October 2022. Uh, so just have a look at the commitments and the benefits um, for the program. Um, so what you have to plug in and what you'll get out of it if you do so. So some of it I've already covered, so I, I won't go through it in, in excruciating detail. Uh, we have the leadership training days of which there'll be at least seven there is your full-time research uh, in summer one and your leadership action in summer two uh, and then the time you'll need for the online uh, content for any kind of extra uh, extra um, extra ordinary uh, groups uh, or anything like that uh, and then to actually make time in your schedule to do the the research posters the reports all that output uh, and through it we also expect students who are involved to uh, be engaged with the different activities that are going on so no you don't have to go to absolutely everything uh, every optional thing that's happening and we don't expect people to be able to do that uh, but it is very much this is not a tick box exercise of a program this is um, something where if you're involved you know we want you to be you know if we have students in the next cycle who are looking for advice on how to apply uh, we would like you to be available to do that we want you to be coming to us with ideas in terms of what you want to do as a group uh, so it's very much kind of a, you know, throughout the program, we want you to, to stay engaged, not just, not just the key dates. And then the benefits. Uh, so I'd say the core financial support in the scholarship uh, to the value of six and a half thousand euro. And so in the first summer, that's very kind of clearly, um, that's very clearly um, ring fenced as a 3,300 euro uh, stipend, which supports you during your research period. So I guess, I guess most essential, the, the funding that we have from the work laid law and from the foundation is to support you to do that research so you don't necessarily have to do uh, take on part-time work, you don't have to do other things, and um, you can really focus full-time in on that research. So there's a stipend in the first summer. In the second summer, depending on your leadership in action option, you may also get a similar stipend, or if it's one of the options where you're, say, traveling as part of a uh, third-party provider internationally, it might go towards your accommodation uh, and your food and all that while you're while you're on that trip. So the purpose of that stipend, as I said, is very much as accommodation, ex, uh, sustenance, subsistence, ex living expenses, all of that that kind of helps you focusing on the research. And um, so that's just in terms of the core financial support. And then on top of that, um, in terms of the leadership development program and all the different opportunities we have, we obviously pay to bring in uh, expert facilitators to do some of the, those workshops. 
uh, we organize different events, we organize kind of travel away and all that kind of stuff. So that comes in under the kind of the scholarship as well. Um, in terms of what you'll get out of the program, I think some of it, hopefully so far, has been self-evident in terms of the skills you would develop, um, but it's very much focused on transferable skills that would take you through research, but also into any other field in terms of project management and, and leadership and team working and your ability to communicate and present your ideas in a, in a compelling manner. And whenever we look at leadership, um, it's very much not about uh, you know, boardrooms and, and, and suits and mergers or anything so cliche as we, we have a uh, kind of an, an aversion the cliche in the program it is actually about that meaningful leadership where it might be one-to-one -one, it might be in a quieter capacity it might be in a team or it might be in a very extroverted or very performative uh, capacity or, or very uh, in the spotlight but it's where you're, you're using your skills to affect change and to support other people in doing so so it's very much those skills we, we want you to be able to develop you develop the research project and have the kind of the leadership action experience and then obviously through the program you have opportunities to raise your profile and interact with people in a similar space. So just to give uh, very briefly I want to give you an example of some of the sessions some of the sample sessions we've had on the leadership uh, development program previously. Uh, some of the highlights over the last couple of years and um, so you can see there we have a session with Linda Doyle who is the Dean of Research on the role of a leader in fostering creativity and innovation. Uh, and Linda Doyle, who is a professor of both engineering and of the arts, uh, so very much in the intersection and kind of the science communication between those two research pieces and how, it, how any discipline can apply that to the research. Uh, we've had some core kind of intensive leadership competency and character development um, work with uh, Melissa Sayers from the MBA program in the business school. Um, and again, that's very much focused on understanding not how you fit into a mold or an idea of a leader that we have, but how you understand what your own capacity for that is. Uh, we've did a session recently on social enterprise and how to make meaningful impact in that area with the Irish Social Enterprise Network. Uh, and one of my personal favorite sessions, probably one of the more effective um, or more immediately effective ones, how to network without cringing, um, which is something that everyone feels is impossible going into it, but we all, we all managed to do it. Um, and that's a very useful one to take away. So that's just a flavor of the kind of sessions in terms of the workshops that we put on, but these are, have very much been generated out of conversations with the scholars around what was relevant and what they wanted to do and what would actually be of use to them kind of in 2020 and 2021. So a couple of items just on the research project. So how do you go about um, actually coming up with the idea and kind of putting a proposal together? Um, we'll have a look at the application material uh, just in a few minutes, um, but throughout all of this, if any of this is seeming, I suppose, overwhelming or intimidating or a huge amount of work, um, what I would say is that there have been very many students who have gone through who maybe not have you know, thought that they were the kind of person who would know how to put together a research proposal or one that would be compelling for the program. Uh, and it, is very, it is very possible to do, and it's very practical to do. Um, and we kind of give you the resources to start structuring that. So you have to start somewhere with this kind of work and, and this is a, is a good opportunity to do that. So the very basic thing we ask you to do for your research project is to define a research question, uh, an original re research question, and um, that is feasible as a project that you can do over one five to six week period over the summer. So I say the most common um, stumbling block we see people do is to take on too much. Um, so in five or six weeks, you're probably not going to solve um, homelessness in Ireland. Uh, but you might be able to solve or make a compelling argument or find a compelling piece of information that you can convey around one area of that, something which is manageable, something which is um, focused, which can be of, of benefit. Um, so you can focus in on those areas and refine that. Um, we ask that it's not part of your core assessed uh, academic curriculum. Um, so obviously it can be related to the things you're studying. And I, I'm sure quite a lot of interest is generated from that. Um, but essentially, we don't want something which would then be submitted for your coursework. This is something you're doing extracurricular, extracurricularly um, from that. Um, so it has to be separate. Uh, and it also is something you should be looking at in terms of um, developing the proposal. How is it going to integrate with your leadership training? So the research piece is not um, in a bubble from leadership development. Um, there's leadership skills that, that researchers use, and academics use in terms of their own project management, their own negotiation within the research group and um, that will be reflected in your project, uh, in your relationship with your supervisor and then there's learning there you can bring back out as well. So how does it fit, all fit together for you? And when you're looking to identify a research supervisor and uh, the very basics for them is that they should be um, willing to support your project for the duration uh, of the kind of 18 months that you'll be on the program. 
and um, they'll have to write a supporting statement that says that they think your project is feasible, that it has academic value, and um, ideally someone whose research interests align with your own and with the project, um, and who will support you and kind of take the responsibility that when, when we're um, kind of not involved and when you're in the academic space with them, that you are getting the ethics approvals you need, if that's something you require, that you have a space to work in the department, if that's something you require, and so on. Um, so it's very much um, something which is going to be a conversation with them in terms of their own commitments, but it's something which uh, I'll, I'll show you some resources that you can share with potential supervisors on that front as well. Um, so just to look at the leadership and action experience, that's obviously uh, often a big question for students, what that actually entails. So what I will say is the summer we're going into uh, now for summer 2021 for our current group of scholars, the 2020 scholars, and um, it'll be the first year we have um, leadership and action experience projects happening for a summer we have, and it's the same across the network. It's, it's kind of a, a newer initiative that's come through. So um, we're very open to hearing uh, kind of creative ideas around what you might do for that. Um, but the, the basic three options we have, or the three areas we want you to focus in on are uh, A, uh, or one, rather, as I have it here, um, leadership expedition. So the idea for this, um, which isn't live at the moment, um, is a kind of a five to six week ex international expedition through a provider, through the foundation, um, where scholars from different in institutions will come together and, and travel potentially to it a different country to work with the community there on a project and in a practical capacity with people who are, with organizations who have been embedded in that community for a number of years and kind of do some practical, some practical work there. And um, so those have obviously been suspended for the moment in terms of the travel restrictions, but what have taken their place is some options that for the moment can be done remotely um, in terms of um, tutoring and kind of projects that can be developed with organizations um, internationally in the UK and in different places. Uh, that can be done remotely with the aim that if the travel restrictions lift that is something that um something that we can deploy students back out to as well uh, the second option is a leadership placement and um, so this um potentially would be something that would build on your research project and the example that i often give is if we have a student who is doing academic research in the area of say migrant rights and um, they might go from that piece of academic work out to work with a migrant community with organizations who are working with that community and do something practical on a project with that. So that's kind of an example of what a leadership placement might look like. Um, but it would be with a nonprofit or a community-based organization, and it would give you the opportunity to develop and apply your leadership skills in a practical way, um, lead on a strategy, lead a group of other people, um, and uh, put that into practice. Now, you might not have no ideas about that at the moment, um, but that is going to be part of the process of potentially cold calling or sending emails to uh, an organization or to a group that you admire, you think there might be some crossover with your own interests and saying, hey, I'm, you know, I'm looking to do this uh, program. If I was successful, um, would it be something that potentially we could do together or even sketch out your ideas around what kind of area you'd like to go into with that. And then the third option is the infield application of research. So the main thing to highlight about this is that this is not a uh, just a second period of, of, kind of pure research or a second an extension of your original research project. The project you proposed for summer one um, should be very much um, kind of self-contained, something you can do within the first summer. That being said, it can be something that you can also look at for your infield application of research if that's something you want to apply for. And you will be continuing the project but applying it in a way um, that has some additional leadership benefit to it, some additional practical skills that you develop. Um, so it could be an application of your idea if you're in a, st a STEM or a space of something uh, within industry or working with a company, making some idea you have practical or, or, or starting that process with them, uh, doing research field work in a community uh, setting uh, where you uh, take your research project and you um, develop it um, into something uh, like an instrument or a resource working with um, communities or with uh, experts in that field. Uh, it could involve traveling to a different institution and doing some some work there and um, again it's kind of more focused in on the research and more of a continuation of your research uh, project than the other two options uh, but it very much has to have that component of how are you going to take your idea and take your research and do it in some practical way and um, uh, ex examples we've had about that are in terms of students who have researched theater uh, in uh, doing some work in that space, uh, doing practical actual theatre workshops with participants and volunteers and putting on performances and, and things like that. So it's that practical aspect 
uh, that we're really looking to develop. Um, so just to look at now, um, just a couple of notes on the funding side of things. Um, so I mentioned the kind of the financial support in terms of the stipend. Um, something to note that when you're on the program, it is categorized as a scholarship and you are categorized as an undergraduate research. So that is tax exempt and you do get the value of that scholarship directly, directly to you. Um, the funding for the program, uh, for the project, you have the research project. We make funding available to your supervisor that they can draw down for lab materials, for books, subscriptions, equipment, anything you might need um, up until a certain value for your project. Um, and then in terms of uh, some of the other supports I've mentioned, um, through the different resources we provide and through various travel grants and kind of additional grants that come up at various stages of the program, um, there's additional value for you there as well. Uh, just one technical note I, I like to make at this point because it can take some time to do if it's not something you already have uh, set up. Uh, we can only make those payments to an Irish bank account uh, and all scholars have, have a PPS number. So if it's a route you're looking to go down, maybe start looking at getting a PPSN now, uh, it'll just save you some trouble in the future. Hopefully it won't take too long, but it's, it's kind of worth, worth looking at um, as early as you can. Um, so that's on the funding side of things. Um, and then lastly, I'm just going to speak uh, a little bit about the, the applications. And then what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to take you through our website. Again, very briefly and highlight some of the resources that I've mentioned. Because a lot of this we go into in kind of more detail uh, on the website itself. Uh, but essentially for the application, uh, we want you to submit an application through our website, through the careers website before the 8th of February. And the components we need for that are the actual application form, which gets some basic information from you. Uh, your research project proposal, uh, which should be no more than a thousand words. Um, and that is, I'll go through that in a second, but that is again an exercise in making your ideas as succinct kind of as possible in terms of your project plan. And uh, for the leadership side of things, we ask you for a combined statement. So we ask for a leadership statement that also includes your leadership and action experience proposal and your own goals for your leadership development, which would be up to 800 words. And um, so with that, we're essentially looking for you to say, uh, these are the areas that I feel I'm strong at, at the moment. This is what I'd like to develop. This is why I'd like to get stronger in these areas over the course of the program. And I think that by applying it in X leadership and action uh, project in summer two, it'd be a great opportunity to put that into practice. And here's my current idea for what I, uh, I might be able to do in that second summer. So you, you, can, you can put all that together there. Um, a new component we've added in uh, this year is a personal mo motivation video, um, which I am confident is the part you're all most excited about. Um, but essentially it comes from feedback we have and from our own experience that everything up until this point is quite formal. You're writing you know, academic proposals, it's all, it's all in written form. Uh, and this is to give you an opportunity to um, kind of show a bit of personality, tell us a little bit about, um, show us a little bit of, your, of yourself uh, in an informal capacity before it gets to a kind of interview stage or, or anything like that. Um, so that gives maximum two minutes and the prompts that we give you, which I'll show you now in a second. Um, is about why you should be selected. And then you can talk about um, what you feel you will bring to the program, why you think the program will benefit you, why laid law and not some other internship or opportunity or other thing you could be doing during the summer. Uh, and then lastly, we ask you for the uh, letter of support uh, from the academic supervisors. So I'm just gonna switch over now from, um, from this slideshow to our website and then in the next couple of minutes, or maybe five or six minutes, I'll open this up uh, for some Q&A. Uh, so you should all be able to see our website there. Please do, do let me know if you can't. Um, but if you're looking to uh, get to the website, um, you essentially, you know, from, from first principles, you land on the Trinity Careers homepage here. Second tab over here after our fantastic um, Zoom portraits is the Laidlaw program. You click through and you're on the homepage. So, as I said, a kind of big amount of um, uh, increase in the resources that we have here for you this year. Um, up top, you can see on the homepage, we have the student testimonial uh, video, which we, you all presume really have at least seen some sight of before this. Uh, I think it's worth watching through because we very much ask the students to tell us in their own words and their experience what they thought you might want to know uh, rather than what I want to hear uh, from the students uh, about what the experience is actually like. Uh, I think something that's highlighted a lot by students go through the program is you know they come to a motivated by the um research opportunities and by the different skills there but they don't necessarily anticipate how in detailed the leadership side of things are or how actually beneficial it is um, and that is feedback which we've kind of gone through the program a, a lot and i think it shows in, in how the scholars kind of 
portray their experience by the end compared to maybe maybe what, when you start. Um, so we have our homepage here, and then if you go down, you have four different areas uh, in terms of the program um, to look through. So about is very straightforward. This is from the foundation, so you can see a little bit more about the kind of the, the wider uh, the wider Laidlaw Foundation. They have a brochure for the their own um, their own material there for the foundation and for the program. And then through this, you can see um, some content here from Lord Laidlaw. You can see more about the work that's happening across the different uh, the different universities uh, and some some of the kind of the skills that the, the program highlights uh, through the foundation. And um, if we want to go in a slightly backwards order, if you look at Laidlaw Trinity, this is very much about the scholars we have on the program and what they've done so far in their own works. And um, so we have um, a few testimonials more from the students here. Um, and particularly when you're putting together your research proposal, and um, if you click into this section here, you can see a summary of all the different pro um, projects we've had previously and the different supervisors. Um, through there, uh, you can see there are a range of different subjects uh, and a range of different focuses all the way down. Uh, and then new for this year as well, if you click in here, and you go through, you can actually see the research uh, posters that have been produced. So I think that'll give you a concrete idea of the kind of thing that we do on the program. Um, so if we go back up then, and uh, if we have a look at the components of the program, a lot of which I've talked through here, but you can read through in your own time. And um, we have a roadmap here, um, which will summarize um, for you kind of a lot of the stuff we've gone through today in terms of what the timeline of the program is and, and what's involved and what you're, what you're getting yourself into. Uh, as it were, you can see here the um, Laid Law Leadership Attributes, and this is from the foundation that informs our program. These are the areas that we're looking for you to develop as a scholar. Um, some more about the leadership in action, uh, and then down here, some, I suppose some of the boilerplate or some of the kind of the important information you want to take away around what the different funding is, what the resources we make available, uh, what the indicative timeline we have for you there. Um, and then what your responsibilities would be and what you would get out of the program if you, if you committed to it. Um, and then lastly, if I take you to the apply page, and uh, there's a couple of things I want to highlight to you here. So if you are ready and raring to make an application, this is the application form here, go through that. Uh, we've summarized what we need for you there, the eligibility criteria. And um, we have a good bit of detail here on how to um, how to find a supervisor and what, how you can go about that through the research pages, see what supervisors' different interests are. Um, what I would recommend um, for um, kind of all your supervisors or all your um, approaches to your supervisors is we have a page here on the website in the staff section specifically for them, uh, which gives some testimonials from other supervisors who have been involved and what the areas, uh, what kind of you know, experience they've had. Uh, and we also have a guidance document here specifically aimed at the supervisor, what the, your, you know, what the student requirements are, what their responsibilities are, and if they're writing a letter of support for you, what we ask them to include to make it as, as useful as possible. So I definitely send along uh, even if, but also particularly if they don't know anything about the program beforehand. Um, and then lastly, um, the last thing I'll just highlight to you is this application guide, which I, I hope I've made sufficiently prominent here at the top of the page. Um, so this really goes, drills down into the detail of what we're looking for in the different uh, sections of the application, what our motivation for the different sections uh, is. There's resource on the career website, general resources around reflection, around preparing for interviews, around preparing statements and things like that, which we recommend before you do anything of this nature, which, which also can be, be used for, um, for the laid law application. And we walk you through the application process, different components and the kind of the this is the stuff you have to get right in terms of naming your files and all that for us to be able to actually go through your application. And there's quite a bit here in terms of what the, um, what the research proposal entails. And um, so I so suppose very briefly from this, I'll pull out that we're looking forward to summarize, obviously, things like what your research question is, what your project plan, as much detail as you can about what you'll do week to week, how you're going to, what methodology you'll use, and um, how you'll deal with potential delays and obstacles and things like that, but we ideally want it to be in accessible language. Um, so it should be something which um, a non-expert in your field um, can read and can tell what your plan is. It is not your research paper itself. It is the proposal for what you intend to do. So we need you to understand exactly how you're going to approach that. And um, what I often say is if you can hand it to someone who isn't in your course and they can't make head nor tails of it, then you need to make it more concise. You need to make it more, more accessible.
Uh, what I will mention here as well in terms of the application process, just to highlight, is all of this kind of refers to our core, uh, our core application process. There is on the application page, and um, you'll see a section here listed for predefined project opportunities with the Laidlaw uh, Foundation. So this is something new that they're offering this year. Uh, again, given the circumstances, um, these are in, in um, cooperation with the foundation, with their partner organizations in the UK. They're open to all the uh, different institutions. So students who are applying via this route will be competing with students from kind of across the network. Um, to work with some of these organizations on these different distinct unique opportunities and the requirements for those um, The features the application process will all differ kind of for the different uh, ones so You can kind of have a look through that yourself if that is something you're interested in And um, if it is I would say if you want to get in touch with us and we can kind of have a look at that look at that with you uh, But the rest of the information we have here will very much pertain to our, our kind of our core or kind of our standard application process um, no, I've lost track of it. Where is it? We're over here um, so in terms of the application form of the research project, again, you can read through this in your own time, but we give you a lot of structure here. Again, if it's your first time ever doing a research proposal, um, what a, a good structure would be, this won't write for you. Uh, it won't um, tick all the boxes automatically, but in terms of how you structure, what might be included in, in an introduction, what's in a methodology and so on, we give you kind of a lot of prompt questions for that there as well. Um, and then similarly for the leadership statement, um, we kind of give you some areas to look at in terms of what you should focus in on that and what we're looking to see. Um, as I put here, and, I, and I'll say to you guys as well, um, try to avoid any kind of cliche leadership quotes or, or anything you think sounds good, uh, but isn't actually something you think. Um, they stand out uh, straight away. Um, what we want to hear from you is what you actually think about leadership and what you actually think you can learn about that. Uh, it could be completely at odds with what you, you think is kind of an offer. Um, but that is, is something which will um, make your leadership statement uh, more genuine and more compelling when we're reviewing it rather than, you know, the, the same material that you can find on any cursory Google search. So please do bear that in mind um, for all of us. And then obviously the section here on the leadership in, app, in, in action uh, project. And then some prompts for the personal motivation video. So as it is the first year we're including this, please do read through this and again, try to make it um, as accessible as possible. So you should be in the video. Um, it shouldn't be a narration over a, a video, of, uh, a PowerPoint or anything like that. We want to see you, we want to hear from you. And um, the prompt question we have there is why should you be selected as a laid law scholar? Um, but what I will make very clear, and I'm, 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 I'm very aware of people um, who uh, very commonly aren't, you know, Public speaking isn't the first thing they, they jump to, nor recording themselves. And um, this is not, we're not looking for something that is highly polished, overproduced, professional, a rehearsed speech or, or anything like that. Uh, it's okay to be informal, it's okay to be genuine. Uh, it should be presentable, but it should be something where we can see you, you're in frame, it's well lit and all that kind of, kind of stuff. Um, but we just want you to speak uh, as sincerely as possible. So it doesn't have to be perfect. It can be recorded um, on your phone if it's of a sufficient quality or, or with a camera or anything like that. That's all absolutely fine. So it does not have to be a, a, an edited YouTube video or anything of that description. Um, I will mention that we do include your transcript as part of the application process. This is not a priority in terms of the application. It's not the first thing we look at. Uh, you don't have to provide it. Uh, we can access that from your record once you've submitted a application and kind of giving us permission to do that through submitting an application we can look at that through through your student record and um, the only thing we look at in terms of that is in terms of developing kind of a picture view as a whole a whole picture view as a student you have your whole um, um kind of uh, contribution for your, for your application uh, and looking at things like um you can help to demonstrate your work ethic and demonstrate the maybe the electives or things that you're interested in and um, but we are not looking for students to have uh, firsts uh, across the board and if you do that's great and congratulations um, but it's, it's not a, a kind of a, a limiting factor in that regard, but it is part of the application process and it is something we include. Uh, and then the research supervisor's letter, so some of the requirements we have uh, for the supervisor there. Um, and then after that, I suppose it's very, very um, briefly in terms of the application process, it goes to a selection panel, um, which includes uh, myself, uh, my colleague in the career service, Orlando, the director of careers, the Dean of Development uh, and uh, Professor Kevin Mitchell is a senior lecturer and is the chair of the panel. Um, and there are also representatives from the academic uh, faculties as relevant in that as well. And um, so we go through that and then based on kind of our, our initial selection process, some students might be invited uh, for interview. 
uh, as well from that. And then if you get to that stage, we'll have more information for you uh, as well in terms of how you approach that. So I won't worry about that just yet. And we can see here I have something on the on the methodology uh, and on the kind of the research proposal. Um, the last thing I'll mention just before I kind of close this down and then we open up for, for Q&A. Um, I just see a question there, sorry, just I'll answer that now. Can a student, can a supervisor be a current or past lecturer or must there be someone from the list on the website? They absolutely do not have to be from the list on the website. Um, it can be any uh, academic staff member who is willing to support you, who is a kind of trinity academic staff member and is, a, is going to be in the college and has a contract and has, uh, you know, will be here for the 18 months of the program. Um, so it does have to be kind of full, um, but you do have to have a full, um, a, kind of a, a fully contracted academic in terms of a, a lecturer or a, a you know a, a professor that kind of thing. So it can't necessarily be a postdoctoral student just by themselves or a PhD student or anything like that. Um, but they don't have to be from that list. Um, that list doesn't necessarily suggest that, that supervisor um, will want to take on a student this year. But I, I, I would say it does suggest that they might be open to a um, to an email uh, about it. But it can be it can be any academic that meets that criteria. Um, so just before I switch back to the Q&A, um, the last thing I want to mention is in terms of the profile for the student, and we've included it in our application material, uh, and we'll be looking at it through the application process. Uh, in addition to all the other kind of requirements, we're looking for students um, to demonstrate in their motivation and their capacity and their interest. And um, we're very much framing the pro program and very much committed to the program being as um, inclusive and as representative of the student body. Um, as possible. So that includes students from all disciplines that are kind of equally and all programs are equally in with the chance with a strong proposal uh, and we're particularly um, keen to encourage applications from students from um, minority groups or from groups which are not usually as highly represented in specialist programs like this. Um, if there's I suppose, anything in that area which makes you think oh I'm not sure if I fit the profile for the student who, who would get a scholarship like that you do, uh, providing that you have a strong application, you're in with as much a chance as, as anyone else, uh, and that's just something we really, want to, we really want to highlight as well at this stage. Um, so I'm just going to switch back over, I should go close down the, the, the share entirely, uh, and we'll switch back over to, the, to this Q&A section. Um, so I will open the floor uh, to you guys if you want to either um, raise your hand in the participants window or enter a question in chat or if you're brave enough if you want to come on mic and ask me a question I'll call on you if you raise your hand um, and then I can answer any question that you have. Um, so some of the questions coming through so far so um, if my study abroad includes a, a summer se the semester I assume I'd be ineligible and um, so not ineligible not ineligible by our definition, but if you're not going to be here for some of the dates that you have to be here for, then unfortunately, yeah, you wouldn't be, you wouldn't be able to take part. But if your summer semester is something you could travel back for for those dates, if that's something you could, con could consider and you flag that in your application, you can absolutely apply. But yes, you have to be here for the, for the core dates that we have. Do you prefer people to have an idea uh, and approach researchers with it, or is it okay to engage with ongoing research? Um, so your research proposal um, has to be an independent, um, an independent project. Now, it might be something that is related to research that an academic is doing. It might be, you know, if an academic is working in, um, in nanotechnology or in a specific area of nanotechnology, for example, and you have an idea that's related to that and which will synergize with their group, absolutely, that's fine. Um, but you have to be able to show us that it's a distinct um, piece of work that you're doing and that you are leading on it, even if it is with the support of the group. Uh, so essentially it can't be that the supervisor was going to do this piece of work anyway and you're just doing it for them. It has to be your, your, your project. Um, but there is crossover there. So absolutely, if it ties in with your supervisor's research interests, that's fantastic. Uh, just as long as you're making certain that you are the, the lead on whatever, whatever small piece of work within the kind of the big, bigger picture is yours. Um, so, let me just scroll through some of these questions. Um, if on Erasmus we have to fund your own travel home for the late law events, uh, yes, that is the case. Um, so we, you know, we, we, we unfortunately aren't in a position to do that. It's very much something we say up front, these are the dates you have to be available for. Um, and 
if they can be online or if they can be blended, we'll do that. But if they have to be in person at the start, you have to take on to come back from your Erasmus for that. So that would be your responsibility. Uh, can you can you apply to both the self-defined and pre-defined projects? And um, generally speaking, we would prefer students not to make more than one application. And um, it should be that you have one thing you want to apply to and one thing you want to uh, you want to focus in on. So I would. Uh, on, on that point, I would say we would prefer you only to apply to either the self-defined uh, or if you were interested to the predefined, predefined projects. Uh, are compulsory meetings only held during the weekends? Um, so, well, not necessarily, but they are, they are held outside of class time. So uh, essentially, we'll never pull up a meeting where we know you'll be in class uh, and it clashes and you can't attend. So generally, they'll be on the weekend or out of term time uh, or out of class time. Um, uh, occasionally, they might be during the week if we know that students don't have class, but they they will be designed not to clash with your with your class timetable. Uh, on average, how many scholarships are awarded each year? So we can award up uh, to about twenty five scholarships on average. And uh, so far, students have kind of fallen in around the kind of the eighteen to twenty two mark. And um, so um, we will only select scholars that we think are strong enough and scholars that we think fit uh, in the group. Um, but it can be up to twenty five. Is there only one scholar chosen from each course? No, there is a, we, we do prefer to have a mix of scholars for various reasons, but the scholars are chosen on merit. So we do have scholars, we have multiple scholars from the same courses in, in different cohorts. So that's absolutely fine. Hey, Joel. Yeah, I, Anne, go ahead. Yeah, Eamon has an interesting question back there about um, research. So do you prefer people to have an idea and an approach research is with it or is it yes yeah, so, so, so that's what i was answering there in terms of it being your own yeah. piece of work yeah so so amen that's in relation to that so you if you have something of an idea uh, and you want to approach a research uh, researcher and they help you develop it and um, you know that's fine to have those conversations but it does have to be it does have to be led by you um in terms of uh, should you present your absolute proposal to a supervisor or can you present okay yeah that's a similar question there so um, I would go. I would start the conversation as soon as you can with the idea you have. Uh, and I'm sure the supervisor will say this is feasible, that's not feasible, and help you hone in. So it doesn't have to be 100% airtight, um, and they can help you develop it. Um, but again, just at the end, you can say yes, this is something I have, I have come up with. Um, because once you start the pro project, you'll be the one doing it, so you need to drive it and potentially pivot it. But you can you can definitely approach a supervisor with a kind of initial few ideas. Um, do you know if there's a way we can get in touch with scholars specific to our course or research interest? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So if you see the list of students that we have, uh, scholars, if you see a, a scholar in your course that you want to get in touch with uh, or a research area that you're interested in, send us an email at employability at tcd.e and we'll put you in contact uh, if, they're, if they're available to do so. So we absolutely encourage you to, to do that as well. Is there a specific six week period for the first summer project? Um, so it has to be uh, essentially outside of, of term time. Um, but no, you can you can define that period yourself with your supervisor. You can say um, for these six weeks that they're available to supervise. If it, if you want to break it up, if it needs to be for three weeks and three weeks, that's fine as long as it's within the bracket of the summer. Um, but we would approve that first. So you would let us know what those dates are and we would say, yes, this, this fits in with that. But we don't say it has to be between X date, date and, and Y date for everyone. People have different dates uh, to each other all the time. Um, does the program help with access to manuscripts or other documents that humanities students might need or is that on the student, student supervisor to work out? Um, so that would be your supervisor would help you with that because they're um, their best place to do that and they'll have the contacts in the department. So that's something I would raise with them. If there's something the program can, can, can do and is in a position to do the facility, that absolutely. But generally that kind of resource comes from the supervisor because they're the experts in that area. Uh, should we approach multiple potential supervisors at the moment to ensure that we would find someone by the application deadline? Interesting question. Um, I would start with the one you really want to work with, if there is one you really want to work with. Um, but if it's the case that they don't, don't get back to you, it's absolutely fine to move on to, to someone else, as long as you're doing that and kind of applying in a professional way. I wouldn't send the same proposal on the same day to four people. Um, but go with your, your, kind of your, the one you're most interested with first, and if you need to approach someone else, um, that happens as well. I've had scholars who have approached three or four people before they found the one that was the right fit for their right fit for, for their project. Um, okay, is there any other questions there or anything that I've missed? If someone wants to draw my attention to it, uh, I did have a quick question. Yeah, Aiden, sorry, I see your hands up there. Go ahead. 
So um, I had a question about the leadership in action part. Um, so for my proposed project, I know a couple of other member institutions have similar or research uh, have similar research or research mm -hmm. that expands on the idea. So show, when I'm writing my uh, that part of the proposal, should I like highlight a specific research group or a specific um, school a researcher, or should I? It would it be should it be more general than that? I think if you can add that specificity at this stage, that would be good. If you can say, you know, if you have approached them already, that's a great note to include. But even to say, I've looked at the the participating institutions. Uh, I think this research group would be a great fit, and I intend to approach them if I'm successful. You can absolutely include that. Now, that's not a requirement for everyone, but it will be something which will show that you have done a bit of research already on what you want to do. So, yes, I will include that if I were you. All right, perfect. Thank you. Okay, no problem. Any other questions? Or have I answered everything completely? Okay. Um, and Amelia has a question in the chat there. She just put it in. Yeah, summer summer two experience a defined date, and uh, the same same as um, same as with summer one. So, for you know, if the leadership placements or pardon me, sorry, the leadership expeditions go ahead uh, through the foundation, they will set dates for that, and um, you'll know those as soon as we do. For the other two opportunities, it will be similar to what you're doing with your potential supervisor. You'll be talking with them or with the organisation you're looking to place with and ask what dates are available and they will have to be outside of term time and during that summer period but again they don't have to be at the same time as everyone else so you can pitch to us what those dates would be um, ideally all together ideally all in one five or six week period because it's easier for you it's easier for us but it doesn't have to be any specific dates within that should we write about ideas for a leadership action project in our leadership statement yes and uh, the leadership statement is two things it is a statement of your own intentions for your leadership development and a proposal for your leadership in action uh, project. So the flow of it, and you'll see this if you go through the application guide, the flow of it should be, I would like to develop X skills, this is what I'm interested in, and um, I'd like to do this over the course of the program in this way, and I think that will culminate in a leadership in action project where I can put it into practice, and here's my proposal for the project. So that's all, all, all one piece. Does the research project have to be strictly related to your core subject? No. Um, in fact, we would encourage inter interdisciplinary uh, projects. Uh, so if it's something where it's medicine and psychology, if it's English and history, and you're an English student, you're a medicine student, that's absolutely fine. If it's completely outside your course area, but you can show that you are able to do that research project and you have a supervisor who you've convinced that it's feasible, it can absolutely be with a different department. So it is not required that it be within your home department, and we would encourage that if you can see a way to link with a different department, and uh, that's a great thing to include as well. Anyone else? I see one message. How might one relate a technical research project, i.e. in stacks to their leadership? Uh, so that's, that's the crux of the question, really. So I suppose um, what I would suggest for that is if you're thinking narrowly about the actual academic topic and the material, it might be difficult to see how that's done. But think a little bit around it. Think how as a researcher, you have to be, you have to project manage, you have to plan your own time, you have to be self-motivated, and you have to you know, show resilience if, your project doesn't go to plan or you're, you're, you're researching something that runs into a dead end. If you're working with a supervisor, that's a hierarchy you're working with and you have to manage as a, 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 you know, an undergraduate asking for time from them and potentially kind of, you know, putting your own ideas out there. So all of that falls under leadership. So any piece of academic work, no matter how solo, um, will have an aspect where you have to develop those transferable skills. So that's what we mean in terms of how that would link into your research project. If you were, for example, to do a workshop with us on networking and there was someone in uh, your area that you wanted to interact with, how you might apply that. So it's kind of the ephemera around the actual uh, statistics and the practical annotations involved. Does your supervisor have to be from within Trinity? You must have a supervisor from within Trinity, your primary supervisor. Um, for the self-defined projects uh, has to be a Trinity supervisor. Now that supervisor can jointly supervise with someone from a different institution if it suits your project uh, and they might have a pre-existing relationship there. 
Um, so that's something the academics can work out, but we have to have a supervisor in Trinity as a, as a primary contact that we can go back to and say, how is this student getting on? Um, but there can be joint supervision in that as well. Um, um, is there any advantage of submitting your application early? Um, no, no, uh, I, I wouldn't say so now because we won't be reviewing them. Uh, we won't be convening the panel as it were until after the deadline. So if you're if you have it done and want to submit it, that's great. Uh, but there's no inherent no inherent uh, advantage to that. Um, if you have applied in the past but didn't uh, get in, can you organise a session on receiving feedback? If anyone's applied before or if anyone uh, has any questions about that, absolutely get in touch with us. Uh, we will give the feedback what feedback we can, and I can absolutely give some some feedback on kind of what areas I would recommend focusing on from your original application if that's the case. And what I will mention now uh, on that front before anyone leaves or anyone else leaves. Um, next Monday, uh, at lunchtime from one to two, uh, we're going to have another session. It's going to be an informal session. Uh, it'll, it'll just be me. Uh, and if anyone wants to join after kind of reading through the application material uh, and having to think about it, if you have any questions you want to ask um, kind of off the record in a way that doesn't Im impact your application or in, or in this kind of setting, uh, I'll be there for that hour as well. So we're going to publicize that after this. And if you want to book into that and pop in and ask me anything, we can do that as well. Um, do we have to have a specific research topic in mind or could we have a general idea and perhaps brainstorm to a specific title? I would imagine that what you're going to propose would be an area. It would be a topic, a theme, a couple of interesting things to look at. You can think of a title for that, a research question, but it's not unusual that in the, in the course of your research, um, you will change. I've seen people change their titles entirely uh, and the questions entirely while still focusing on the same area. So just come up with a, a, a starting title and go from there, but you should have the idea when you're talking to the, the supervisor. Do you need to add a backup plan for the leadership and action part of the program in your statement if for some reason it doesn't work out? So part of your statement should include what you would do if you encounter obstacles, and that should be for your research and for your leadership. So you can say, I intend to work with this. Uh, and it's been, part, it's been part of what we've had to do with scholars this summer uh, as COVID has kind of you know, changed plans. Where we said, look, I'm intending for leadership in action to travel to the United States and work with this university to put on this, pro, this uh, play, for example. That's one that sticks in my mind. Um, but if that didn't work out, I could work with a, a theatre group in Dublin. So if you have those eventualities, you can show you've thought of those contingencies, do include that. Um, but if you haven't thought of every single eventuality now, that's not going to be a problem. Just show as much thinking as you've had kind of up until this point. Um, where will the link for the session be? So uh, I'll actually, I'll, we'll send out by email to everyone who booked in uh, to this event uh, and we'll put it up on our website as well. Um, so the, uh, and, and uh, again, I'll send this information out with the time and date, but it's just to let you know, it's going to be on Monday, it's going to be at lunchtime, one to two, it's going to be on Zoom uh, for the informal session. Uh, when should we start approaching potential supervisors? Now, now, as soon as possible. Um, but just purely because we're going into the Christmas period and because you can't knock on supervisors' doors or catch them after lectures in the same way that maybe you could last year, um, I would start that conversation as soon as, as, soon as you can. Um, and uh, Again, it doesn't have to be fully developed at this time. You do have up until the first week of February. Um, but say, look, I'm looking to research in this area. I'm interested with this. I think if you look at these three things, um, here's a link to this very helpful one page that the Career Service have put together for you on how to be a supervisor. Will you be interested in talking about that? So I would start approaching those supervisors as, as soon as practical, as soon as practical for you. How can we find the emails of certain supervisors we might want to approach? So if you have a look at the supervisor, finding a supervisor section on the website, uh, I've linked you to Trinity's research pages. Uh, and Trinity has a, has a very well integrated research component where you can search by research interest, say um, aging, and you'll see all the academics who have listed that on their profile. Each academic has a, a research profile. Um, so either through that, or if you go to a specific department, go to the people section, you see all the academics, and they tell you all their publications, what areas they're interested in hearing from students from, if they put enough detail into their, their profile and their contact details. So either through uh, the research pages, which are linked on our application website, or you just go to the, the, the department website, to the people section, and it'll be listed there as well. If there's anything, any question I haven't called out, if, anyone, if you want to put it back in there, uh, I might have missed it, uh, or if anyone has their 
timed up by having the same. Okay. Um, so going twice. Um, sorry, Joe. Yeah, go ahead. Um, Liz has just sent me a message there. She said she needs the link to the laid law supervisor's website. So that's one of the, that's our staff pages, isn't it? Yeah, so if you um, if you go on to the uh, we'll, we'll include the application we'll include the link to our label application page in the email we send out to students after this session. If you go there and go through how to find a supervisor, you'll be able to find the information from there on how to see the staff profiles. Okay, folks, so it's a quarter past seven, so I'm going to finish up now. Uh, thank you very much for your time and for your attention. I hope that was helpful. Uh, I hope that gave you some information. Uh, and we're very looking forward to hearing um, from you and from your applications. As I said, if you want to read through our information, pop along on Monday if you have any questions, or if anything else comes up, send us an email at employability at tcd.ie. I'll be happy to help you. And otherwise, uh, good luck. <laughs>